this guy wants Anything in, happens. he's gonna have to show me Who's some blood on his hands. Show your kid how he's You are an officer. Winston! This is an atmosphere. You can feel it. You can see it. You can hear it. You can identify what it feels like just from those two senses alone. But if you were to walk around it, you'd expect to feel certain things too. The wind, the sand. Some parts of an atmosphere are tangible, even to someone who isn't actually there. Even in a video game, you'd know if a game had the atmosphere of a beach versus if it didn't. The aesthetics of this beach is an atmosphere, but so is this. And this. And even this. Atmosphere is a bit of a tricky term in video game discourse. To the layman and to many of the academics who study games, the term isn't absolute, and people of all levels of academia still argue over what the definition of an atmosphere is due to the sparseness of empirical research to this day. So, how does one define atmosphere? And more importantly, how does one use their definitional framing to judge game design based on a game's atmosphere? Let's look at one of the best games I know, Sleeping Dogs, and see if we can try to discover what good atmospheric design in games is and does through example. Unless, of course, you want to go through every video essay ever and sift through hours of debating about atmosphere without an example. Your call. And number three, being the atmosphere of the why game, what's around the player. Important. A game's atmosphere is more today, important than you might think it is. Well, it's it's why it's the difference between a game's atmosphere and a game's atmosphere is a game's atmosphere is a game's atmosphere. What's going on? Just keeping an eye on things. Yeah? What'd you see? I tell you what I didn't see. Nothing to be impressed about. Sleeping Dogs isn't a popular game. Like a lot of other releases at the time, it was a game that sat, both in budget and scale, comfortably between AAA big budget games and indie games, in a category James Stephanie Sterling coined as middle shelf games in around 2011. Its production was more complicated than that, and there are already videos that go into great lengths about that, but the end result was a game that didn't make quite as big of a splash as, say, Grand Theft Auto, but still managed to find its niche. I only found Sleeping Dogs because a code for it came for free with the new computer I got, but once I started playing it, I found that I couldn't put it down. If I got sick days in high school, I'd play Sleeping Dogs all day long, feeling utterly transfixed. I felt like I was in the world of Sleeping Dogs. I was obsessed. I wanted to keep living in this world. A term you've likely heard before to describe this feeling is immersion, and you might expect me to use this word a lot in a video essay about atmosphere, but I actually kind of want to do my best to avoid it. If you want to learn more about immersion, I can't recommend Barry Kramer's video essay about it enough. It's in the description. But suffice it to say, immersion can't be used interchangeably with atmosphere. Rather, immersion is a byproduct of a game's atmosphere. Immersion is never something a game by itself creates. It's something a person does in reaction to a game and several things about them, with one of the most important things in a game being its atmosphere. Today, we're looking at the game instead of the relationship. Using Sleeping Dogs, the game with the best atmosphere and one of the strongest feelings of immersion I personally have ever felt from a game. What about this game causes this immersion? Can a concept like a game's atmosphere even be quantified? And most importantly, what can we learn about good game design from the atmosphere in games like Sleeping Dogs? Sleeping Dogs is a game released in 2012, and most people would call it a GTA clone. It features game mechanics very similar to that of Grand Theft Auto games, like walking around an open world as a character in 3D space, driving, shooting, and a mission-based story structure. Unlike the GTA games, Sleeping Dogs places a heavy emphasis on hand-to-hand -hand combat and takes place in Hong Kong, although it doesn't really, but we'll get to that later. You play as Wei Shen, an undercover police officer who has been transferred to Hong Kong from San Francisco to infiltrate and weaken the Sun on Yi, a powerful triad. Shen works for several triad members as well as police officers over the course of the game, engaging in a mental battle of what side he's on and who he supports. The game also takes you all over the game's take on Hong Kong. 
Over the course of the game, you discover the location of Hong Kong as Wei does, finding not only the larger areas, but also every nook and cranny the game, as well as your own curiosity, takes you. The game's location and moment-to-moment -moment surroundings, which are not necessarily the same things, are incredibly important in this way. As with a lot of narratives, you are a stranger in a new world, and you spend a lot of the game discovering places while conducting your business. So, is the atmosphere of a game the summation of these locations and moments? Not really. The trouble with holistically defining atmosphere in games is that it's made up of so many moving parts working in tandem with one another that to define atmosphere by any useful metric is to leave out way too much of what works. Of course, defining atmosphere with every single aspect in mind also can't be done, as not only would the definition be too detailed to be useful, but also the longer and less simple a definition is, the more difficult it is to be clear and more importantly, universal. This is largely the reason why atmosphere in video games has a hard time getting defined. Still, we need a framework, even if we intuitively know what atmospheric feels like. So, we're gonna be using the framework for atmosphere in games put forth by Supergiant Games' Greg Kasavin. At a talk in GDC in March 2012, Kasavin put forth that atmosphere is a combination of a theme and a tone. A theme being the central idea of an artistic work, and the tone being the author's attitude towards that theme, accomplished through design. According to Kasavin, Just having graphics and sound in a story doesn't give you atmosphere for free. Uh, before you can have it, you need to have an idea of what the atmosphere is, is trying to convey. So, with this idea of theme plus tone as the framework, examining four key aspects of Sleeping Dogs' design will tell us why its sense of atmosphere reigns supreme over a lot of other games, including a lot of GTA clones. Those aspects are the aesthetics, the overworld, the gameplay, and the polish. Once we examine these four aspects, then bring them all together, not only will we see what Sleeping Dogs does to deserve its sense of atmosphere, but also what other games do, don't do, and could do to follow this example. Like way too many terms in this video, aesthetics can be a bit vague or unclear, so for the purposes of this analysis, aesthetics largely refers to three properties. The narrative, the general art design, and the general sound design. Aesthetics are often framed in casual game coverage in a primarily visual fashion with factors like sound and tactile input playing second fiddle to visual design, but nope, aesthetics can refer to sound design too. So, for the purposes of this video, we're going to go with Simon Niedenthal's definition of aesthetics, which is twofold. The sensory phenomena that the player encounters in the game, and the aspects of digital games that are shared with other art forms. Wait. Are video games art forms? Ah, whatever. We'll tackle that one another day. When deciding art direction, it's incredibly important to know where a game takes place. Aspects like color, lighting, tone, and effects are heavily influenced by what location a game is trying to emulate. And here's where Sleeping Dogs, in my opinion, took a smart turn. Despite the location of the game being called Hong Kong, the game doesn't take place in Hong Kong, not as we know it. It takes place in a kung fu movie. Now, believe it or not, a kung fu movie isn't just a movie about kung fu. It's a genre-specific term. Kung fu is a genre sprouted from another genre of Chinese cinema known as wuxia. Wuxia, even though it was coined recently, has a complicated and arguably millennia-long history. So, to make a long and nuanced story very short, wuxia movies as a genre typically consist of a hero that doesn't come from the oppressive or higher class and fights for what is right in a clear moral code. Oftentimes, this hero either knows martial arts skills or is skilled with a sword. If you've ever seen the movie Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, you've seen Hollywood's take on the wuxia genre, which, according to Wikipedia, was the movie that introduced wuxia to Hollywood studios. A statement about as accurate as Harry Potter introduced magic to international hit movies. The Sword and Zoo Warriors from the Magic Mountain both influenced and worked with Hollywood studios long beforehand. No real point here, Wikipedia just uses vague language to give you a contextless, half-correct story. So, what's the point of bringing up Wuxia? Well, it's largely to note how kung fu films sprung up from the genre. In his book Chinese Martial Arts Cinema, The Wuxia Tradition, author Stephen Tio notes that the Wuxia film emphasizes the pursuit of righteousness and inner skills, whereas kung fu movies, keeping these themes of chivalry and righteousness, focus on mastery of the body. Both the themes of bodily mastery and pursuit of righteousness are front and center in this game. 
Not only is virtually all gameplay outside of a car for the first half of the game oriented around outer physical skills and more realistic fighting, whereas Wuxia opts for more phantasmagoric actions, the very narrative is crafted around not only fighting for what is right, but discovering what it even means to be right. It took a long time of defining Chinese cinema to get here, but this game takes place within the world of a kung fu movie from every angle. The art direction grabs colors and shots during gameplay and cutscenes that are reminiscent of the genre, the narrative proudly displays tropes and homages rather than reinventing the wheel, and the DLC proudly shows off outfits and situations from a ton of famous Hong Kong action films from Drunken Master to Enter the Dragon. In fact, most of the films that inspired this game came from Hong Kong specifically. Though interestingly enough, the movie that inspired this game the most, the one movie where, without it, this game likely wouldn't exist, would come from the most unexpected place. It's the late 90s, and following the success of 1995's Rumble in the Bronx, Jackie Chan was now a household name in the American mainstream. Fresh-faced director Brett Ratner wanted to capitalize on this newfound attention to Chan, and met with Chan to pitch his newest film, Rush Hour. Rush Hour would end up being Jackie Chan's first major Hollywood blockbuster and did tremendously well, opening at number one in the North American box office in September 1998, causing the launch of the website Rotten Tomatoes, fun fact, and catapulting an American obsession with Hong Kong-style martial arts movies back into the mainstream at a level not seen since the success of Bruce Lee's Enter the Dragon. While it was reductive of the genre, opting to combine its tropes with that of American buddy cop movies, and largely a silly comedy movie overall, this movie combined the feeling of a cheesy American action movie with a Hong Kong martial arts movie, and its tone is likely what the layman pictures when they think of an Americanized Kung Fu movie to this day. Sleeping Dogs doesn't even bother to hide this clear influence, casting Tom Wilkinson to play largely the exact same type of role in the game as he did in the movie. This kind of straight-up wink to the audience is a wonderful indication that the studio knew exactly what they were doing and what they wanted to do. They didn't want to emulate Hong Kong as we know it, they wanted to emulate a Hong Kong style action movie. At the very least, that's how it comes across to me. I can't pretend to know the director's intent, but the clarity of tone in Sleeping Dogs heavily implies my interpretation is correct. On a whole, stories borrow from other stories, usually either to strengthen the stories themselves or to build an atmosphere. Sleeping Dogs, in a surprisingly refreshing move, makes no effort to do anything overtly new with its story or hide its influences, and instead leans into its cheesiness to maximize its feeling of being in an 80s to 90s Hong Kong action film. Even the narrative reflects this, with Wei helping out his friends and even random civilians to attain an almost Mary Sue level of feeling like a badass yet morally good character. This theme, and there's that word again, of the morals and beats of a kung fu movie are clearly present. This is why understanding the moral roots of wuxia and the history of kung fu action films are important, as from the outside, it may be tempting to say that making a game's atmosphere comes with being deliberately unique, because a lot of the time gamers imagine the best atmospheres to be unique and special to themselves. This game deliberately chooses cookie-cutter tropes within its story to maximize atmosphere through association. This is seemingly done under the idea that players of Sleeping Dogs don't want an original story or even a profound one. They want one that would fit in a Hong Kong undercover police action movie with all of its tropes. Cheesiness or other traits that would detract or lose points with an original story instead serve to enhance the experience. And, as Kasavin advises, the tone is built entirely around this theme of emulating the feeling of a Hong Kong kung fu movie. The tone is set wonderfully, not just throughout the narrative as I described, but through the art direction and sound design too. Everything is geared around the feeling one would get from a fast-paced feeling and setting akin to an action movie. The sound design, on its own, is a brilliant contribution to the overall feeling of being in a cramped, action-packed world. The people yelling... The atmospheric sounds and music... So you mentioned your sister back there. Maybe? Even the menu and UI sound design. At a certain point, this sound design becomes something felt rather than heard, as Karen Collins expresses in her book Playing with Sound, a theory of interacting with sound and music in video games. Players hear these sounds and connect them with other senses in a multimodal response, which takes sound and visual experiences and glue them into a cohesive experience. 
This process is called synchrosis, where the combination of separate stimuli combine to form a new experience. It's not just that the sound design and visuals are both good, it's that they serve the same end and ultimately create something greater than the sum of their parts. Remember, this isn't meant to emulate the feeling of the place Hong Kong. It's meant to emulate an action movie about it, and it clearly succeeds doing so. The most important part of this success, which is weirdly unsung in so many reviews, is that if you're a person who has not yet been to Asia, like myself, Playing sleeping dogs can feel like stepping into another world entirely. It's stereotypical, but it doesn't feel like my daily surroundings. I feel, and here's the word, immersed. Not only do I feel sucked into a world unlike my own, I also feel sucked into Wei's story. There's a particular drive to understand Wei's own flawed idea of morality within the story and to embody it. This is getting into completely subjective territory, but no GTA clone before or since, including the GTA series itself, has inspired me to feel what the character was feeling quite like Sleeping Dogs. Its fast pace, amazingly astute emphasis on world graphics instead of things that would date worse like facial animations, and fluid feel makes it feel like an action movie too. And feeling is important. It can't be quantified, but you instinctively know if you're feeling what a game wants you to feel. The improv teacher Rob Norman, in a class I once took, told students to come on stage with an emotion rather than an idea of where you are or how the scene will go, and Sleeping Dogs is the video game embodiment of this rule taken to its fullest implementation. The atmosphere, from the get-go, is set up as a Hong Kong action movie, and the understanding that the aesthetic needs to serve a feeling more than a location puts this game a cut above. This game understands that you're no more in Hong Kong in this game than if you're in the south of Italy when you're playing Super Mario Sunshine. You're in Sleeping Dogs, and Sleeping Dogs alone. So, let's explore this world of Sleeping Dogs. In the game of Sleeping Dogs, you as the character of Wei Shen have to contend with and juggle two opposing identities, a law-breaking triad member and a law-enforcing cop. This may not seem like this should be the point that opens the overworld section, but it's this foundational point from which the overworld operates, since these form the two attitudes with which you as a player approach the world. That of someone who wants to uphold the law, and that of someone who wants to undermine it. How the heck does a game developer make a world where both of these attitudes feel like they perfectly belong in the world? How do you construct a tone that serves both of these ends? The mechanics of fighting don't change in this game based on who you happen to be fighting, with one small exception. Given this, it's the job of the narrative and the overall tone of the game to make distinctions based on who you choose to fight at any given moment. Fighting is fighting, but who you fight against can make the difference between being a good guy and a bad guy. Both gameplay and narrative have an easier time of showing both sides of way compared to your location, because in one world, you need to feel right at home whether you're being a cop or a gangster. The overworld has to make you feel at home regardless of your moral choices. This is challenging. Especially since when most players are given a whole world with many options as to what they can do, they hardly want to adhere to arbitrary rules that clearly can be broken. This is why, most of the time, a player will act and feel like a gangster. The narrative accommodates for this through the status of being undercover, and this notion that of course Wei is going to act like a gangster most of the time while he's undercover, though the fact that cops can only serve as antagonists in moment-to-moment -moment gameplay is a bit of a misfire. However, the design of certain levels, while not exactly serving challenge too much, serves the atmosphere brilliantly for both gangster levels and cop levels. Anecdotally, the mission I remember the most from Sleeping Dogs is actually Popstar Lead 3, which doesn't really contain much action. You drive to a location, parkour onto a boat, and hide, taking a few pictures. Given the lack of stimulating gameplay, that really should be a low point in the game, except the level design, which like nearly all missions is accessible at virtually any time in the overworld, makes the scene feel dynamic, interesting, and real. This may surprise longtime players of Sleeping Dogs who might expect a mission one remembers the most to be one of the more high-octane ones like the wedding mission or the infiltrated hospital, but 
This lead case is the only one where I can vividly remember every part of the set piece used. The wedding mission was emotional and fun, but I find that when replaying the mission, I'm remembering rooms I once forgot and not going, yep, just as I remember, like I did with Popstar Lead 3. I felt like a badass cop foiling the plot of the gangsters when I played this mission, and it was a mission in the same game where I felt like a tough red pole in the sun on ye. The way this game used the overworld to accomplish both of these feelings is no small feat. Like many parts of the game, Popstar Lead 3 is also a departure from the standard shooting, fighting, and driving, and that breakup of monotonous gameplay has the potential to make any game better. As mentioned, this game takes place in a Hong Kong Kung Fu movie, so the entire overworld has to serve this aesthetic to create the proper atmosphere. I've found there are three most important criteria to this when making the overworld. Eye-catching, exotic, and important. Eye-catching is the most self-explanatory. Action movies rarely have boring sets, so even without action, places need to feel interesting. Using multiple vertical levels, set pieces, lighting, and the very technical term of a lot going on can go a long way to make a setting look eye-catching. A game's overworld needs to look exciting and try to look constantly exciting, and Sleeping Dog's overworld does this in many ways, from the exciting lighting of the nightlife to the popping colors of the stores. What doesn't look eye-catching is also strategically placed, giving the player's eyes a break so they can appreciate whatever eye-catching scene comes next. The exotic factor is a very poignant part of making this game's settings look like a Hong Kong kung fu film for obvious reasons. To the target demographic of North American gamers, this place needs to look strange and unlike home. To my knowledge, a lot of the designers actually went to Hong Kong, saw the sights, and took thousands of pictures to properly catch the feeling. If you're making Hong Kong, you don't want it to feel at any time indistinguishable from the typically American and British cities that litter GTA clones. The atmosphere could not be comparable to the American and British city games, and thus, it needed to look and feel exotic. More importantly, having a simulated space feel exotic to a viewer, perhaps even a viewer that has been to Hong Kong, makes the player invested in exploring the world and discovering this world for themselves. Exotic in this context doesn't necessarily mean coming from a different country or culture, it means alien to the player in a positive context. Sleeping Dogs aims to feel exotic, but so does a game like Bloodborne, which players shouldn't be able to compare to their daily surroundings unless you're from London, in which case it feels like daily life, except a little less grey. How about the third criterion for an overworld, important? Like with the other two, it's hard to quantify, and it's a weirder distinction, but it has a clear reason. Especially in story-based locations, the settings need to feel like they have significance. This could be employed through the use of set pieces or gameplay-serving elements, but it could also just feel like important, powerful people would meet here, or like big events happened here, or even the general feeling of, wow, this place is big. A setting in the overworld can look eye-catching and feel exotic, but this feeling of significance and purpose drives the feeling home. It's the cherry on top, it's the haymaker at the end of a fight. The importance of a place is probably what makes you remember the most memorable location of any video game. The use of these three descriptors in tandem gives locations their weight in Sleeping Dogs. As an anecdotal example, let's look at the mission where Wei raids the house of Two Chins. The place looks expensive, full of interesting furniture, styles and decorations that Westerners likely don't often see, and you as the character are sneaking around and even being there feels naughty and defiant, etc. This is an extreme example that scores highly in all three criteria, but a lot of everyday locations in Sleeping Dogs will give these feelings too in some measure. These three criteria can be thought of as pathos-oriented goals to drive the tone forward and serve the theme of the game. The gang hideouts sprinkled throughout the world show this off well. Almost all of the gang hideouts, the ones with video cameras, take place in visually distinct areas, will sometimes feature different vertical levels, and can even switch up the gameplay. But most importantly, most of them feel like their own interesting area, will often feel like they really are the important and significant location of some gang hideout, unlike some games we know, and not only feel exotic to the player, but in many cases, exotic to each other. And this note of the gameplay serving this choice is important. The overworld can't just look interesting, exotic, and important. The gameplay across the entire world must also feel this way to immerse the player and ensure the right atmosphere. Without the player feeling moment to moment like they're an undercover cop gangster in an exotic world, what hope do aesthetics have on their own? You may not have considered gameplay as part of the atmosphere, but it's inherently connected. In fact, let's talk about it some more.
The trouble with tackling these sections as sections, like aesthetics, overworld, and gameplay, is that what makes an atmosphere works requires a cohesion of all three. Ultimately, it's in how these elements combine that truly makes or breaks the atmosphere. That said, when people think of an atmosphere in a game, they typically think of the world and how it aesthetically comes across. A lot less of a spotlight is given to the gameplay and how what you can do in a game serves the atmosphere, and Sleeping Dogs is the perfect game to help give that spotlight to gameplay as an important component of an atmosphere. As basic a question as it may seem, it's helpful to ask the following. What can you do in Sleeping Dogs? It may be tempting to list off the things you can do in a vacuum like, oh, well, you can walk, you can drive, you can shoot, but that's not the full story. For example, it's not always true that you can walk. If you're driving or in the middle of the best minigame ever, karaoke, You can't walk, not without doing something else to prepare for it first. This is where we get assistance with what's called the gameplay loop. A gameplay loop is basically everything a player can do when they're playing a game, in order. It's a set of actions, often portrayed as a documented account of all repeatable actions and every action a player will do from start to finish. In a simple NES game, it looks like this. It not only highlights every action you can make, but what they connect to, the win state, the lose state, etc. If I were to make one accounting for everything in Sleeping Dogs, it would look like a mess of connections and words so massive that it would make the Pepe Silvia meme look like a mild concern. So, where is this going? Well, as mentioned in the overworld section, what a player does at any point needs to be cohesive with the overall tone of the game to serve the theme and facilitate a good atmosphere. This extends to more than just the narrative consequence of assisting the cops versus beating up an officer, this extends to the gameplay as well. What the player does during an average run-through contributes heavily to its atmosphere. Think of your favorite game. If the game was the exact same, except you had to do grade 3 math problems instead of whatever else the gameplay asked of you, would you consider it any less atmospheric? Odds are you would. Even without making a gameplay loop for Sleeping Dogs, we can note clear patterns of dominant mechanics. From this, we can see that Sleeping Dogs has three real modes. Fighting, walking, and driving. These three things represent in some form what you'll be doing for 90% of the game. All three, ideally, are done to enhance the immersion factor and atmosphere of the game itself. So, let's look at how they do that. Everything mentioned before, the aesthetics, the overworld, the player's actions, have to serve the atmosphere not only whether you're acting as a cop or a gangster, it also has to serve the atmosphere whether you're driving, fighting, or walking. While walking is the weakest example of memorable gameplay in almost any game, it still takes up a lot of time during a playthrough, so the developers had to put in effort to make it feel cohesive with the world. Walking is, obviously, done to get from point A to point B, and it's the slowest form of transportation, so it allows a player to take in the aesthetics of the game without being too fast to render a player unable to notice. While it's not that involved or memorable, this is hardly a problem unique to this game, and it still serves the tone. Driving is an interesting mechanic because it allows you to be more of a maverick than other GTA clones. Sleeping Dogs allows you, in driving mode, to ram other cars in a burst of speed, which not only allows players to explore their mischievous side and bond with Wei Shen's inner gangster, it also speaks to a concept that Steve Swink outlines in his book Game Feel. Swink argues that to achieve game feel, which is a complicated concept that deserves its own video, but we'll just define it as that moment you feel in sync with what a game is trying to do, for now, a game has to have three things. Real-time control, which is a form of interactivity where you feel a satisfying response to the input you give, polish, which we will get to later, and simulated space. In a nutshell, simulated space is basically that feeling where you know where your character is in the game's virtual space and how they can interact with the world. For character-based immersion, simulated space is pretty much always required. The way Sleeping Dogs plays with this concept is by not only allowing you to drive on its streets with parking meters and cars and pedestrians to hit, but also giving you an option for hitting other cars if you understand your spatial relationship to each other. This RAM feature is surprisingly important. It offers you a fun mechanic and advantage over other vehicles, but requires you to understand your simulated distance and time the RAMs carefully. The clear conveyance of simulated space is on full display here. Without it, the RAM function wouldn't work, and this means more attention is paid to simulated space than it would in most applications in, say, GTA 4. Now, 
let's talk about fighting. As someone who has spent over half their life practicing martial arts, the first thing I noticed when fighting in Sleeping Dogs versus Arkham Asylum or GTA 4 is that the fighting is based on actual martial arts. I looked this up to be certain, and sure enough, the two lead designers drew from their own background in MMA. It's noticeable, because not only do the fights look noticeably more realistic in terms of how the body moves, it also looks more exciting, and the fact they pulled off both is impressive. As well, fighting feels more fluid, with a more reactive counterattack than Arkham Asylum and a very consistent yet decently complicated moment-to-moment -moment fight cycle. Sleeping Dogs, to my own experience, is unparalleled in its ability to draw me in when it comes to fights. While the skills required aren't nearly as immense and the actual feedback system is incredibly different, there's a weird parallel to the Dark Souls games here, where the fighting feels responsive and the hits feel satisfying. The fighting is the most memorable of the three primary modes I mentioned earlier, and it very clearly creates its desired feeling well thanks to its attention to detail and faithfulness to real-world fighting as its inspiration. Every moment spent fighting reinforces the feeling of a kung fu movie where I'm the protagonist, which I feel was the desired or central theme of the work. The dedication to reality and its depictions of bodily movements is integral to this real feeling of truly taking down an enemy. I don't feel like my character is knocking down an enemy. I feel like I am. And that's the key the gameplay holds to the game's atmosphere. The atmosphere of Sleeping Dogs would feel like a cheap museum tour without feeling like the atmosphere includes you. At the beginning, I may feel like a newcomer to this world, but by the end, I feel like I'm an integral part of the world. I'm Wei Shen, Sun On Yi Red Pole, an undercover cop. I'm not in the world of Sleeping Dogs. I'm a part of the world of Sleeping Dogs. It may be tempting to define atmosphere without looking at the actions a player does, as if atmosphere is just the passive elements of a game, but to do that is to ignore how the atmosphere comes from facilitating a player's actions to fit cohesively with the world. It's not just what they experience, it's what the experience becomes with their actions. No game is what it is without polish. Polish is everywhere in games. Polish is important. Polish is... hard to wrap your head around a lot of the time. In complicated terms, quoting Steve Swink's game feel again, Polish refers to any effect that artificially enhances interaction without changing the underlying simulation. Whew, what a word salad. In layman's terms, polish is all of the little details that aren't necessary to make a game technically playable, but would be noticed as a detriment if absent. This could be anything from this particular box not being there versus being there, and, at the extreme end, way having no animations when moving. The game is technically playable without it, but odds are it would break immersion so much you wouldn't want to play the game except to hate play it. Polish is in a weird spot because, by definition, it's all the stuff you don't need in a game, but without it, no one will like your game. Polish is basically as important as a game's inherent mechanics to make an effective experience, but it's not just the first thing on the chopping block for a development team. Except for cases where a team is drastically altering their game, everything on the chopping block is polish. Most teams with a publisher only have a set amount of time to create a game, so they can only include so much polish. Polish is kind of like jazz in this way. It's all about what you're not including in a game, the notes they're not playing, because it says something about what a dev team wants to keep. For instance, a game having a lot of bugs and glitches is the result of a lack of polish in a given area, and to be fair, Sleeping Dogs is a noticeably buggy and glitchy game. I don't think I've had a single playthrough where I didn't encounter a new bug or glitch that took me out of the experience. Ricky, it's Way. Shit, Way. How you holding up? I got Johnny a lot of loose ends to clean up. I need an outsider Man, for a couple things. You, you got Johnny, Johnny Ratface's number? Your conscience when he's done, you know what I mean? Yeah, I know all about him. So, given this, it's clear that the polish didn't focus so much on the functionality of the experience as much as the flavor. Given the game's bizarre and tumultuous history, which you should definitely look into, it was clear the team didn't have the time or resources to polish every aspect of the game. And given the details of the aesthetic experience, it's really clear that they put most of their time budget on polishing the effects that would go into the feeling and tone of the game, rather than consistent functionality. There are a million things I could point out that are small choices from virtually every element of design that enhance the experience, and why not? Let's go on a tour of some of them now. The themes of trauma and stress associated with Wei's work are a nice touch that the story could have survived without, but still was made better by their inclusion. I like knowing that seeing people get murdered doesn't just make Wei sad or stressed sometimes, it gives him PTSD nightmares. That's just... realistic. 
And speaking of the story, the subplot of Wei meeting his old Sifu was so well handled. The fact that their meeting was a chance encounter connected to another story, the way the reintroduction was natural without too much heavy-handed exposition, to the extent where two of the reviewers I looked up genuinely thought Sifu was his name, and the way it has ludic, or gameplay-related, consequences by leading to the statue collection and new moves. The sound design also includes nice little details too. The way that most UI sounds condition a player to understand if they're doing something where the game is keeping score, the choice of music and feelings in things like radio ads, the fact they used actors like Tom Wilkinson, James Hong, and Lucy Liu to voice act for characters when they're all associated with cheesy Americanized Hong Kong action movies, and the one thing in particular that really sells the sound design in the polish for me, the chaotic way a sound assaults you in high-energy areas like the night market. Like, if you've ever played Sleeping Dogs, odds are you immediately know who I mean when I bring up the pork bun guy. You look like you could use a pork bun! That's sound design, and that's polish. It's not just all of these small sounds in a vacuum, but rather, how they all interact and come together to form the atmospheric soundscape of the game, which drives immersion. Polish makes or breaks the most memorable moments of any game. This is also true of the visuals. In the details, like the reflections in the streets or the wet look of a lot of the surfaces after rain, but it's not just in textures. The verticality of the buildings, giving the game a larger feel, is polish. The player rarely sees roofs from ground level, especially while driving with the relatively fixed camera, and that's intentional for the sake of the larger-than-life exotic feel. The lighting still finds a way to show daylight well, even with the verticality of the buildings, and at nighttime, the neon and lights of your surroundings light up the world, with street signs and adverts littering the world for greater effect. These aren't random details, these are purposefully cohesive polish elements that combine to create something great. Even the actions the player does have polish, it's not limited to the environment the player takes in. In particular, the game makes huge use of what many call the hit stop, pausing or slowing down the game to make certain actions, like ramming or finishing a fight or pulling out a gun, have weight. These examples might be less of a hit stop and more like what Masahiro Sakurai, creator of the Super Smash Bros games, coins as a boss stop, which stalls the whole game and or environment instead of a character at the point of impact. Sakurai's video on stopping to give impact's weight is in the description and I'd highly recommend it. Whatever one wants to call this effect, it's undeniable that moments like this give moment-to-moment -moment gameplay weight and make players feel more cool. That's right, you can't deny this moment made you feel more cool. You can't. If you do, academically speaking, you're a liar, and that's illegal! These may seem like isolated details that were nice to include, but these weren't good unrelated ideas to tweak in a vacuum. All of the details I just included were all consciously debated and workshops to make sure that when they were included, they served the same themes and tones. Polish serves atmosphere in its unity. A bit of polish that would have pulled in another direction, like making a particular building look faithfully like a building found in New York, would have taken away from the atmosphere. The inclusion of these details is important not in the existence as separate details, but in the fact that all of these seemingly unconnected things serve the same theme by playing as their tone. When I talked about Unity, I hope it comes across clearly that this was not just a point relevant to polish. These aspects of aesthetics and gameplay and the overworld and the game's polish aren't separate entities because, ultimately, they all come into the same game and serve the same end. At the same time, this essay wouldn't truly get into the heart and soul of why these choices all worked if I looked at the game top-down, or as one product without breaking it down in some way. As I said in the introduction, it seems silly to analyze the atmosphere of a game by breaking it into components, but it's only by understanding these components separately that we can understand how they cohere or stick together. If you haven't played this game yet, I can't recommend it enough, even as an experience rather than a game. Sleeping Dogs, while it never sold as amazingly as AAA games, remains a masterwork of atmosphere, and on a personal note, it remains one of the games that can still successfully transport me to a completely new feeling world every time I play. Could nostalgia be a factor there? Of course, as it does in most people's biases. 
But I also played GTA 5 a year later and Mafia 2 a year earlier, and while they have their merits, in terms of atmosphere, neither of the two games could hold a candle to sleeping dogs. If you're an aspiring game designer or even a game critic, you could learn a lot about how the aspects of games can come together cohesively to create an effective atmosphere by playing sleeping dogs. If you enjoy playing games with a critic's eye, it can feel tempting to play games to figure out what not to do in game design, but I find that playing sleeping dogs makes me come away with it with positive critical thoughts, with the ideas of what worked so well in the games that I could ignore its shortcomings. That, to me, is valuable. If the goal is to be critical and take notes on games, we should play games that remind us what works more than games that remind us what doesn't work, lest we fall into the trap of thinking that cynicism is somehow more valuable. Sleeping Dogs is a positive example of game design, and that's good. A final note to leave this video on is this. Atmosphere isn't optional. It can be bad, and it can be barely noticeable or not much of a factor, but a game can't really exist without an atmosphere of some kind. It's integral to the experience. Whether you agree or not, it's important to highlight example cases of atmospheres in games, because it's not an optional component of games. As much as this is an atmosphere, so is this. Or this. Or even this. So please, if you're making a game and want players to remember the experience, spare a thought for its atmosphere. And games like Sleeping Dogs are all too happy to use what they know to show you how it's done. Strange to say it after all that's happened, but Hong Kong kind of feels like home. Yeah. But which Hong Kong, officer? The lieutenants like Winston. Open your eyes, Ray, show your true I am Winston. That's what we're responsible for.